Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us in person and online. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Dewey Holton. He is a professor of chemistry here at Washington University, and he has been in that position since 1989. Dr. Holton has quite an interesting background. He was an undergraduate student here at Washington University and received his bachelor's in chemistry in 1973. He earned a PhD in chemistry at the University of Washington in Seattle, followed by a postdoc at Washington State University. And then after that, he returned to St. Louis, Washington University, and in 1980 became assistant professor of chemistry. So he clearly likes Washington. <laughs> Dr. Alton's research interests include the initial reactions of photosynthesis and the study of tetrafluoral chromophores for applications in solar energy and photomedicine. This work is carried out in collaboration with his wife, Dr. Christine Kermeyer, research associate professor of chemistry also at Washington University. Dr. Holton has approximately 230 research publications, and his awards include the St. Louis Award in Chemistry and the Midwest Award for achievements in chemistry. He is also the Associate Director of PARC, the Photosynthetic Antenna Research Center, which is an energy frontier research center funded by the Department of Energy. So thank you. Without further, further I'd like to introduce Dr. Holden. Thank you for agreeing to speak with us. Thank you, Natalie, and uh, for all of you here and online. Um, <clears throat> Today I'd like to tell you about basically two topics in a very broad sense, one, is, one of which is work that we've been doing for many years in our laboratory, dealing with one aspect of photosynthesis, um, which is reaction centers. Um, it's not a project in PARC. And then in the second part of my talk, I'd like to actually tell you a little bit about PARC. Um, and one of the specific projects that our group and many collaborators in PARC are working on dealing with the eye harvesting part of photosynthesis. Um, and those two different topics are actually listed here. This is reaction center part and this is eye harvesting part. So I'd like to acknowledge, um, now we mentioned Chris Kumar. Um, and I'm doing this because uh, on many of the slides and a lot of the research in the first half of this talk are actually hers, and I lifted them from, from her presentations, um, and tell you a little bit about that work first. So in general, this is very simplistic. You all know that uh, photosynthesis is the uh, foundation of basically life on Earth. It takes the energy of sunlight, um, which is the energy, water, carbon dioxide, and produces the food we eat or the O2 that we breathe. Um, this is what happens in oxygenic photosynthesis in um, plants and, um, uh, and so on. Um, and this is a diagram that shows you the distribution of chlorophyll, which is the central chromophore of, of photosynthesis in plants on, on land, on the earth. You can see it's very well distributed. One of the things that um, related to our work that's not often well appreciated is also uh, a great deal of the photosynthesis actually occurs in the oceans uh, by um, cyanobacteria and, and bacteria which actually don't evolve oxygen, which, which depending on the species can or cannot evolve oxygen. And so basically photosynthesis is just really prevalent over the whole um, earth and the oceans. And so it's important to understand how photosynthesis works. So there's two basic aspects of photosynthesis that, um, that interest us, one of which is um, light energy is absorbed by a, a large complex of chlorophyll molecules or bacteria chlorophyll molecules called the antenna. That excitation energy is the form of the reaction center in which charge separation occurs um, to generate the chemical energy that is required uh, for growth and survival. Um, it's often pictured in this terms of this like uh, collector in terms of uh, uh, a radio dish where the energy is collected and then funneled and turned into some type of uh, signal um, for um, capturing um, that energy and signals from the solar dish. So the, the, um, the reaction center which I'm going to talk about first um, in a simple view, um, because the photopore is photosynthesis, it can be viewed 
built by charging a battery. That's a nice analogy where you have light energy, you separate charge over some distance, and then that, that energy then can be used for um, subsequent reactions. And it's a rechargeable, self-repairing battery, and, and, and we'll see that the charge is generated every time the photon is absorbed, and virtually every time. And as I'll show you, this charge separation occurs very fast, less than one nanosecond, 10 to the minus 9 seconds, and the quantum yield is approximately one. So that's very, very um, efficient in terms of the quantum yield of the process. And it occurs in a special membrane protein complex called a reaction center, which is the focus of some of the work that I'm going to tell you about first. So the work that I'm going to tell you about actually occurs in photosynthetic bacteria, um, not in plants. And so that's different than the leaves. Um, photosynthetic bacteria of this type, um, they don't take water. They use sulfur compounds and, and other materials to grow. They don't involve oxygen, but they do generate um, sugars and ATP and things that grow in some leaves, just like happens in plants. So this is a um, photosynthetic bacteria. So and, um, here's the picture of the, the organism. And inside the organism, there are these membranes that contain all the necessary components that I'm going to show you some pictures of. There's the antenna complex that's shown here in green, um, the specialized, uh, and also in red, in this reaction center outlined in purple. And this cartoon, this, 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 um, this image shows some of the, the pictures of the actual complexes in the membrane that we'll focus down on a little bit more here. So um, here's a, a cartoon. This is actually from one of the collaborators in part, Neil Hunter and, and collaborators, where you have, you can see this image with all these little circular structures inside of these membranes. These guys here, the little circles are light harvesting two. Then here's light harvesting one complex. And inside of that is the reaction center. And actually, you can see a blow up of, of that here. And you can see this distances involved. So these distances and sizes of these chromophores are about you know, a million times less than the width, than the width of a human hair. And so these are really tiny complexes, um, big on sort of molecular time scale, distance scale, and a bit large on a macroscopic time scale, macroscopic uh, distance scale. So in these um, light harvesting complexes, chlorophyll molecules or bacteria chlorophyll molecules in these light harvesting two rings transfer energy to this, this bigger ring and inside of this to this reaction center that we're going to sp spend some time talking about. And here's the cartoon that shows that, that process. So um, x-ray structures have been done to show the molecular detail of these complexes. And this just shows here, again, high harvesting two complexes, these beautiful rings of bacteria, chlorophyll molecules, and proteins we'll look at from the top. Um, here's this high harvesting one ring that we'll talk more about with this reaction center, the functional core inside. Here's a side view of the IRC2 and a top view over here. So here's the top view. If you look at it from the side, you can see these beautiful green and blue colored helices that span the membrane that hold the bacteria chlorophyll molecules that actually harvest the energy. And here's my RC1 from the side and from the top showing the reaction center um, inside. So again, I've said this before, these, these, these complexes, which are key elements of photosynthesis, are located in these membranes that are inside of the core of the organism. And they basically accomplish these two major functions, which is harvesting the light energy, transferring it to the reaction center, and moving charge across this membrane. So here's a, a shows you the same process from an artist's conception again, showing light harvesting this reaction center, which I'm going to start focusing on, plus other components of the photosynthetic apparatus. And in the natural photosynthetic system, light energy is absorbed by the antenna. The analogy would be that's mostly what you would see in a leaf in terms of the color. That's mostly what you see. Um, and then the bacteria, they harvest the energy, and then they transfer this energy to the reaction center and starts moving charge. So this is our analogy of charging up a battery. And then once that happens, the electrons generated by this charge separation move to another complex. They move back across the membrane. They get transferred to a, a cytochrome, which is a water, which is a water-soluble uh, electron carrier. It moves back to this positive charge. 
And so you've then uh, done light-driven cyclic electron transfer. And during this process, protons are transferred from one side to the other, and that's called a pH gradient. And that pH gradient then is the chemical energy that, that, that is then stored across the membrane, because that's your charging up with the battery. And then at some point later on, when it's required, those protons are pushed back to the other side of the membrane, and that generates ATP, which generates the carbon and the substrates that go into the Calvin cycle. So that's how the overall photosynthetic process works. Light energy, reaction center, proton gradients, and then the generation of the, of the fuel. So what I want to spend a little bit of time focusing on is even going down more molecular, which is to focus on the function of this reaction center, this battery-like object, and its um, components are shown here. It's composed of bacteria chlorophyll molecules, bacteria pheophytins, which I'll show you, don't have metals, and quinones. And once the light energy from the antenna reaches this reaction center, you, you make an excitation in here, and then charge separation starts occurring from one component to the other, electrons moving, the steps a picosecond is 10 to the minus 12 seconds, so this is like a millionth of a millionth of a second. The first charge separation occurs, the first events. The next step's a little slower, 10 to the minus 9 seconds, which is still pretty fast. And then you separate a charge in the reaction center, and then these other slower, dark reactions of photosynthesis occur. We spent now about 25 years studying this process in the reaction center, in our lab, and that's what I want to spend a few seconds telling you about because the molecular detail is actually interesting and can be very well appreciated. So, um, whoops, let's go back. So here's the cartoon that I showed you, but actually we know a lot more than that. And here's the structure of the reaction center from purple photosynthetic bacteria. There are two, and this is important because um, the this was the first membrane-bound protein whose structure was assigned to atomic resolution. It was solved by three German workers, Dyson, Walker, Google, and Mikkel, in 1986. And just two years later, they got the Nobel Prize in chemistry for that, um, for that achievement. So at that point, we knew the molecular detail of how the molecules were organized in this reaction center. So shown in gray is one. Uh, protein subunit with these helices, protein helices that span the membrane, um, and that's called the M subunit is the, is the gray, the um, tan are called the L subunit, and that holds two chains of cofactors. So there's four bacteria chlorophyll molecules, one, two, three, four, abbreviated P and B. There are two bacteria theophytins which differ, they don't have little dots in the center, that's because there's no magnesium in them. Those are called bacteria theophytins and then two quinones. And if you, the interesting thing about this structure, like the antenna that I showed you before, is they have high symmetry. So if I take a line and draw it from P down through here, through this iron atom, this line, and I, and I would rotate the structure about that line, this bacteria theophyte would reflect on this one, this bacteria chlorophyll on this one, this half of the diamond on this one, and then these two quinones are a little bit shifted on this one. So there's basically, once you excite this dimer with the, with the energy from the antenna, the electron has two ways to go. It can go this way, or it can go this way. And when the structure was first solved, the question is, well, how does this occur, and what, what, what actually happens? So through, and, and that's what I'm going to show you here. So here's, here's a, a blow-up of this picture. So what we do in our laboratory uh, is excite this dimer with a 0.1 picosecond bullet of light, Excite this dimer and watch the processes that occur. And in the natural photosynthetic system, electron first occurs, the, goes in a, a, a picosecond or so to this bacteria chlorophyll, then onto the CFITIN in two steps. The overall time is four times 10 to the minus 12 second. So exceedingly fast. Then the electron moves from this, from this bacteria CFITIN to this clone in 200 picoseconds, and that's occurs with about 100% yield. Electrons don't occur this alternative pathway. It just goes by that right-hand pathway. So basically, we spent now 20 or 25 years trying to figure out what, how fast these steps, how they, how they occur, why does it go only this way, and can we entice it to go this way, and by doing so, learn how the natural system really functions, and then how
how to build artificial systems for solar energy converters and using these multi-step electron transfers because this is so efficient. So it's really interesting, at least to us. So um, the way we do these experiments in our lab and the way experiments of this type are done in the Park Laser Facility by Derek, uh, he's with you, sitting in the audience, is to use time-resolved absorption spectroscopy and um, it's easily understood. Here's our picture of our reaction center again and, and the processes that occur. And here is the absorption spectrum of the reaction center complex that shows you what colors or what wavelengths of light the reaction center absorbs when it's just there in the ground state before anything happens. These two bacteria phytophytons absorb at two different slightly wavelengths because they have slightly different protein environments. This dimer of bacteria chlorophylls that receives the excitation initially is out here um, at 850 or 860 nanometers. So um, um, you want to use this spectrum then in the time resolve sense to try and assess where the electrons go and how fast they get there. So the way we do this experiment is uh, again called time resolved absorption spectroscopy. It's like having a, a camera that you're taking a flash at a certain time and try and capture what events occur by, by looking at the color changes of the sample. So we would have a sample and we have two pulses of light, one of which excites one small region of the sample. Then we have a white light probe pulse that contains all of those different wavelengths. That goes through the excited region of the sample plus an unexcited reference region. So after the sample, then we have two beams of light that are transferred through the sample, one of which assesses the reaction center that's been excited and one the reference. And by looking at that difference as a function of time, we can tell, as I'll show you an example, uh, where the electron goes and how fast it, it takes to get there. The way this experiment is done, femtoseconds or picoseconds is very fast, and so it's hard to have an apparatus with electronic charge response that goes too fast. But what you remember, I think probably all of you remember, is the speed of light is three times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second. And if you think about that, what that means is, is a little bullet of light will move uh, one centimeter in 66.7 picoseconds. It'll move one millimeter in 6.67 picoseconds. And so if you change down here, if you change the distance over which this pulse travels compared to this one, if the excitation pulse, if the probe pulse um, goes over a distance one millimeter longer, then the excitation pulse traveled, it will uh, go to the sample 6.67 picoseconds after excitation. If I move it 2 millimeters, it, proposes, it takes a little bit longer for it to get there. If I take it, have it delay a foot, it takes a nanosecond, 10 to the minus 9 seconds to get there. So basically, by adjusting the distance difference over which these pulses travel, you would change the time at which they arrive at the sample, and therefore you can probe, like looking at a camera or something moving, um, what happened to the sample. And so here's an example. Uh, so we excite the sample with a pulse of light out here. Then we're probing in this region from 500 to 600 over here, where these two different molecules absorb at different wavelengths. And we're monitoring the difference between the, the, the and, and so this is the ground state spectrum. So what do we see? At 30 picoseconds after excitation, um, there's a dip here in our different spectrum where this molecule over here absorbed, and that dips there because that molecule is no longer like it was before. It's received an electron. So its absorption bleaches, it changes. And so that's what that little dip there is. If you wait 1.6 nanoseconds, the dip goes away because now the electron has moved from here to here. This molecule is back to normal, so the spectrum goes back to as a, with a blank in that region. If the electron had moved this way, and arrived on this chromophore, before this dip wouldn't be here, the dip would be over here, lined up with the absorption spectrum of that molecule. So if you do an experiment then to entice electrons to go this way, you'll see a little dip here, that will get bigger, less electrons will go this way, this one will get slower, and that's smaller, and that's how you can see the difference of the pathway. And by looking at how fast these signals will grow in and decay, you can tell the rates or the times of the process. So that's how, in, in the reaction center, the native system is deduced to work only this right-hand path. So uh, I like this one. This one's not as fancy as Derek's apparatus, but this is our, origin, our original. This was our 
1990s early vintage apparatus, and here's the sample sits over here, and here's all the optics. Um, all of this stuff now fits in a box about the size of this table, like Derek has down in his lab. Um, this is a keepsake, so it still works. <laughs> Uh, so in the native, in the native photosynthetics, so I'm just now I'm going to summarize um, 15 years of work in one slide. So this is basically to show you sort of what we've been able to do using this sort of technology. Uh, so here's the native unidirectional reaction center where electrons only go the right hand pathway, 100% that way. Um, it took us um, during this period over here. This, this we started working on this about 1980. It took us until about here to get bidirectional electron transfer. We made mutations near in the protein near the cofactors to change how hard it is to get electrons to go one way and make it easier to go someplace else. And by doing that, we got bidirectional electron transfer where about 60% goes this way and 30% goes this way. Um, then we, um, oops, yeah, here we go. Um, so then we. Um, made some other mutations and samples in which the reaction center is totally dead. It does nothing. We cycle the dimer and it just decays back to the ground state. And that's actually a nice framework. So then, then we figured out how to make three mutations to take this dead reaction center and entice it to go 70% this way and none this way. So now we've taken the native system, which is virtually all this way, and got it really high going this way. And then knowing how that sample worked, uh, by a couple of mutations, we took um, it to go over to this side, to this, in this reaction center, this other chromophore that's sitting over here is missing, so now the electron just sits there, and we can study it. In the native system, you'll probably remember that the electron hops onto here in four picoseconds, four times ten minus twelve seconds, and off, so it only, it's a fleeting existence, it's very hard to study. And in this one, the electron hops over here and it lives a lifetime for us, which is 500 picoseconds, 500 to 10 to the minus 12 seconds, which gives us lots of time to study so we can then characterize the, the, the nature of this chromophore. So over this period then, by these sorts of studies, molecular engineering of the protein, we went from all one way, all the other way, and made lots of manipulations in between and learn how the native reaction center uh, really functions to do this charge set. So here it is summarized again, um, showing you um, live harvesting, the reaction center, which we spent a lot of time studying in our lab, uh, and then the subsequent processes and what we've achieved by um, studying the reaction center function. Okay, so that sort of ends the reaction center story, charging up the membrane to tell you what happens at a molecular level detail of how that central part of the photosynthetic process actually works in photosynthetic bacteria, which is very similar to how it works in photosystem 2 of plants. So now I'd like to turn to PARC, tell you a little bit about PARC, starting off the series, or not the first, but near the beginning of the, of the series of talks this semester. Um, so the goal of PARC is the photosynthetic antenna research. So I'll tell you a little bit about PARC and then one of the projects that, that our group and collaborators were intimately involved with with PARC. So PARC, uh, basically, without reading this, is focused on studying um, photosynthetic, uh, native photosynthetic antenna complexes to maximize their, um, to, to understand how they work, to maximize uh, their efficiency, and then to use that knowledge to construct artificial systems for solar energy. So PARC has, um, uh, it's a very broad-based group. We have five faculty members here on the Washington campus, um, members of other institutions in the U.S. and other universities, national labs, and then two in the U.K. So it's a very geographically diverse group who are brought together to study all the various aspects of photosynthetic antenna and synthetic animals. Uh, here's a list of the, of the collaborators that, that are uh, in, in the park group. Uh, it's, it's headed by Bob Langenship, I'm associate director, and then all the various uh, uh, faculty members um, and investigators of other universities. We also have a very strong research affiliates program. Others that are interested in PARC that, that collaborate and bring other tools and knowledge to bear. And basically, that's a very large group, 17 affiliates from 15 institutions in six countries. 
So there's a variety of antenna complexes. This is sort of like a gallery of antenna uh, showing you all the various types of native photosynthetic antenna found in various organisms um, that serve a variety of functions. And they basically have different structures, content, depending on the environment in which the organism grows. And one of the central themes of the park is to try and understand how all of these work and then use intimate knowledge for individual components to construct artificial systems of various types uh, for use. I've already shown you some pictures of LH1, this ring with these reaction centers. Uh, LH2, which is a sort of connected with the reaction center. LH2 with this ring, with the chromophores. And I'm actually going to come back to those in just a second and show you some more detail. So PARC has three central themes, native antenna, and subcategory structure and efficiency. That's theme one. Theme three is at the other end, which is bio-inspired antenna. These are totally synthetic chromophores, molecules, chlorophyll-like molecules, totally synthetic antenna. And then theme two is bio-hybrid antennas, which contain a native component and a synthetic component to bring together to try and construct things that you wouldn't find in natural systems. But maybe this one. The overall vision and synergy of the, the center is summarized in this diagram that we like to call the, the, the vision diagram. It shows you the three themes, natural, biohybrid, and bioinspired. And then central research projects that link these together include elucidating antenna structure and dynamics, improving the solar coverage. I'll touch upon that topic in a moment more forcefully. Optimizing, optimizing antenna size and architecture and developing tools for further studies, to facilitate studies of, of light harvesting and antenna. Underpinning those, we have a very strong education and outreach component and building intellectual and technical capacity for understanding antennas and light harvesting um, use in the future. So here are some pictures of uh, native antenna complexes showing their UV visible absorption spectra, and here's some of the structures that go along with them. And you can see that depending on the habitat in which the organism, the organisms that use these antenna are located, um, the, uh, the the molecules, the, the antenna complex is absorbed at, at all various different wavelengths. But one of the things you can see for each of these, if you look with this black one, for example, um, the Finna Matthews, or you look at LH2. They absorb a specific wavelengths, but there's lots of holes in the spectrum. There's lots of places where the antenna complexes don't absorb. So for example, this one over the ultraviolet to the near infrared, it will only absorb uh, sharply at, at half of the wavelengths in the spectrum. So although these complexes are very efficient of taking light and delivering it efficiently to reaction centers, they um, absorb only a fraction of the light. So one of the themes of part both in native systems and in the ones that we construct, is to fill in these underutilized regions of the spectrum to make better use of the solar energy that's available. And so, um, one of the areas of work that I'm going to tell you about very briefly here are biohybrid antennas that make use of native uh, proteins, but utilize also um, analogs of chlorophylls and chlorophyll-like molecules that absorb more of the solar spectrum. And, and this is actually work done by one collaborator, um, John Lindsay. So if you look at nature's pigments, here is heme B. This is the basic molecule that you find in hemoglobin, which doesn't absorb light. It contains iron, and it contains this cyclic structure of carbons and, and nitrogens and, and electron distribution. And, and this is called porphyrin. Then if you see there's a double bond here, if you remove that double bond, then this basic molecule is called a chlorine. It's the basic molecule for chlorophyll A in plants. Um, and now the absorption spectrum of the hemoglobin, which is like this blue one here, is turned into this green one, which is the basic absorption spectrum of chlorophyll. So um, basically removing this double bond is one of the central reasons why grass is green and blood is red. And so, uh, and you can see the difference in the absorption spectrum. Now if you take this double bond over here and take it away, now there's two double bonds removed. And we 
change the structure again. This is the basic molecule called bacteria chlorine, which is the, which is the core chromophore used in bacterial photosynthesis. And now the, the main absorption band moves out here to longer wavelengths in the near infrared, past where your eye, absorb, your eye can, can see, out here at 750 nanometers. But you can see there's lots of solar energy out there. So by making use of these transformations from porphyrin, chlorine, the bacteria chlorine, you can tune the absorption spectrum in terms of the, the key absorption wavelengths over a broad range. By going to bacteria chlorine, you can use this really uh, hot part of the solar spectrum out here in the near infrared region. And by making analogs of these, you can fill in all wavelengths between. And so the key then is to take those sorts of synthetic molecules and incorporate them in the scaffolding to make antennas that function like the native antennas. And so this is to show you that basically, here's the solar spectrum again, and here's an integral showing you that 60% that of the solar photons over the visible and near infrared are greater than 600 nanometers. So you really would like to work out here to, um, to incorporate new absorbers not utilized by the native antennas. So here's an example of some molecules made by John Lindsay's group that we studied uh, over the years in our lab, and I've been studying David Boshin's lab uh, as part of the uh, triumvirate collaboration. Um, chlorine molecules, absorbing a, a set of them that have different in these substituents between 600 and 650. Chlorine inhibits that contain this structure, shown here in the intermediate region, and bacteria chlorines that are absorbing out here at longer wavelengths. And you can see you can step across the spectrum. So if we can incorporate, ideally, whole set of these molecules in antenna, we can basically have a black absorber to absorb all the different wavelengths, or, or subsets of them. And, and uh, now pushing out towards 800 nanometers to absorb even further and even further. So what are we going to incorporate this into? So here comes back to some of these pictures that I showed you before for the native bacterial antenna systems. Here's live harvesting 2, shown from the side with the protein scaffolding. You can see these blues and greens. And the bacteria form for the molecule is shown in red. Here's the top view. And I can, so you can see the tops of these helices. There's one here in green, and one here in blue. They're right next to each other. And the red chlorophyll molecules stuck in there. So here's LH1 from the side. I showed you this before. Here's this ring-like structure with the reaction center in the center again. But now if I look at the protein from the top, here's this blue helix, and here's the green helix with some of the bacteria chlorophylls. And now you can see this pattern. Green, blue, green, blue, green, blue. You can see this very <coughs> structure, these two peptides, blue and green, and you can see it like this too in LH1. And here's this basic structure of these dyads. So a beta peptide called green, alpha peptide called blue, and these native antenna systems are constructed by, and, and here connecting, um, sandwiched in these two peptides are the native two bacteria chlorophyll molecules that are coordinated to these two histamine amino acids. And here's the blow of those two bacteria chlorophyll molecules. Those are absorbing the light out there at 850 or 900 or, or, or 870 nanometers. So the, the native antenna, the point is, is the native antenna systems are these oligomeric arrays, these beautiful cyclic structures, comprised of these alpha beta protein subunits that hold this bacteria chlorophyll diamond. And that's the basic construct that we want to use, that we are using in our biohybrid antenna systems by incorporating chromophores of this type into these structures to complement the native absorption to fill out more of the solar spectrum. So that's the point. And so here um, is a cartoon of some of the logic. So identified here on the beta peptide are a set of locations where we can change an amino acid to one that we can use to connect one of the synthetic chromophores. And we can do it at any of these positions. And these points were chosen. Here's the top side view. Here's the top view. And here's the side view cartoon of what the structure would look like if we incorporated a chromophore on one of these sites. And they're outside of the main helix, so they should not dramatically interfere with the formation of those complexes by bumping into each other. So here is a set of bacteria chlorine molecules made in the John Lindsay lab, a couple of synthetic dyes uh, that we initially chose to 
fill out a lot of the solar spectrum not absorbed by the native antenna complexes. So those native bacteria chlorophyll dimer absorbs this black right here. You see over this region, it only has a little bit of absorption. So there's a lot of window, a lot of hole where we can pick chromophores and attach them to those peptides to make use of more of the solar spectrum. And so um, we did a lot of initial studies with um, these, these truncated peptides called 30 wonders, and we learned a lot from those. And now we've moved into these full-length systems that I just elucidated. Um, we, we have alpha-beta peptides that give us a lot of locations where we can connect things and form nice, um, uh, stable oligo oligomeric structures. So I'm going to give you two examples of this to show you so, so these things that we did, and these, these first, this first example is based on some mutants that were named in uh, the UK, Neil Hunter and John Olson, two of the Clark collaborators, and they incorporated what are called cysteine residues at this position on beta, or this position on alpha, in which um, uh, synthetic chromophores could be attached. So here's one where um, this molecule called Oregon Green was attached out here way out at the end of the, of the beta peptide. Then those samples were um, prepared into um, these subunits and oligomeric structures by Paul Loach and Mark Weston. Then we studied them here in our laboratory in, in, in the St. Louis, or Derek did on um, Congress on absorption apparatus. And we did steady state experiments. And the bottom line for this is, is once you excite these molecule, the synthetic additional chromophore that absorbs the green region, um, it's a pretty low efficiency, 10% transfer to this native site to capture that energy. The second one has this rotomy red, this red absorber that um, um, that's absorbing, um, this um, called rotomy red that absorbs in between 5 and 600 nanometers um, on this alpha peptide, and that one alone gets 30% transfer. It's a little better because it's a little closer, has better spectral characteristics. But then if you combine the two in this mutation, in this, in this construct, now you excite this molecule, it transfers energy to this one, then you transfer energy to the bacterial chlorophyll dimer. So the overall efficiency now has gone from 10% to 20% by incorporating two different molecules that have different colors and can make this relay. And so it's only a factor of two increase, but it's, it's, it's pretty good. And it gave us the first indication that this multi-step transfer to utilize the energy more efficiently could, could work. So here's another one. So here, again, this is synthetic um, peptides attached to Oregon Green all the way out here at the end, just like before, this 10% transfer. Then we incorporated one of John's, a separate beta peptide, had one of the, the John Lindsay's synthetic bacteria cores attached. This one by itself gives 90% energy transfer, which is a lot more efficient because these molecules are absorbing a lot more strongly, and they also um, have good spectral overlap characteristics with the energy acceptor, and it's 90% efficiency. Now if you take beta, this beta, this beta, and alpha, and bacteria chlorophyll and toss them together, you form these mixtures that contain alpha beta chains with this one, alpha chains with this one, um, and various statistical mixtures, and now what you see is overall this, now this one, rather than being 10% transfer, the overall efficiency is going up by a factor of 7 to 70%. Because now in this mixture, these guys that are showing green can transfer energy to the guys shown in black, which is John Lindsay's bacteria forens. Those guys have you know, 80 or 90% efficiency in the site. So the overall efficiency now is jumped by a factor of 7. So by making use of these sort of constructs, then you can really capture more of the solar spectrum get the energy very efficiently to the target site, even if the chromophores are way out here on the ends of the strands. So uh, the conclusions from those sorts of um, studies is we really like working with these full-length complexes. They're very stable. They make lots of options for incorporating chromophores. We can use, use of multiple chromophores to increase solar coverage, and enhance efficiency from distant, distant sites. We're now into making larger assemblies that maybe we can put together, analyzing the structures via microscopy, and the ultimate goal is to be able to pattern them on surfaces and to make real um, actual usable constructs for these sorts of microbial systems. 
So this aspect of the park work, which is just one small component of this park, involves all of these various research groups and collaborators, including Derek in the park facility, uh, California Riverside for characterization of proteins, the peptide assemblies are made in Northwestern, the chromophores are made at North Carolina State, nail patterning and um, AFM and some of the mutants are being done in Sheffield, and, and all this work is supported by the Department of Energy on uh, Basic Energy Sciences um, grant. And so we come back to um, the initial uh, theme of the work, which is harvesting energy, ultimately getting that energy to a site that can be utilized for driving chemistry that we want to um, do. So I'm supposed to give a, a brief um, um, pitch here for the bioenergy class. And so instead of moving rid of this, you, know, you can get points for taking for, for courses, um, working on outreach activities, attending seminars and other um, events such as this one. To get a total number of points is 11, and then this leads you to a certificate in bioenergy and uh, renewable, renewable energy and environment uh, posted by Clark and ICAN. So that ends the presentation, and I'll be glad to take any questions. And hang around, because we have pizza. <laughs> any questions? I want on some of you guys' thesis committee, so you better ask me a question. <laughs> Some of you have already got your degrees, so I can't do that. <laughs> no questions? So, I mean, it's another bit. So, what did the protein environment is altered around the dye molecules? And how would the orientation of dye molecules change the energy transfer efficiency? Yeah, so, so the, these constructs are all located in detergent. My cells, and so we actually don't try and change the environment very much. Mm -hmm. But um, so if you take one of the synthetic bacteria chlorines and you study it in an organic solvent such as toluene or methanol, and then you attach it to the protein, put it in the membrane, the absorption spectra of the synthetic chromophores on the peptide in their environment are very similar to what they are in an organic solvent, so they don't change very which is one of the things we like. So if you're constructing a light harvesting system that has chromophores that will absorb certain colors, you'd like to transfer that energy to another chromophore that absorbs another color, you have basic knowledge based on studies of the simple systems, and then when they get incorporated into more complex structures, you, you end up with something that you would expect based on the, on the starting knowledge, because they don't change very much, which is very useful. The other question you asked about distances, if you look at some of those connecting linkers that we use, they're super long, they're flexible. We like that so that they can flop around and come to a nice hole in the structure. But the disadvantage is, is that then they're, we don't know the precise distances. So they are certainly, there's distribution moving one place to another on the structure. Um, but the overall efficiencies are still very high. Right, right, right. Yeah, because you said some of those are like 80 or 90 percent. Also, if you have, so is there any specific reason to put them vertically on top of each other or not naturally, or other orientations like a T or other? Well, the native antenna are, they, 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 they assemble in these cyclic structures, right? Okay. So you're asking why the locations of the chromophores where we have them? No, uh, yeah, for example, in, I mean, in LS2, you have two of them stacked, like tail to tail, or like right one on top of each other. But what if you change the orientation and just flip one horizontal? I think the end of the is Okay. Is this all? Yeah. Uh, if you have two dice on the same construct. Yeah. So this uh, on, the, on the extreme right, so one you have dye molecule which is vertical and the next one is also vertical. So is it possible to... Mean these guys? Yeah. These? Mm -hmm. Oh, those are the native bacteria chlorophylls and so those are, those are not the synthetic chlorophylls. Those are just natural bacteria chlorophylls that would be in the natural antenna. Okay. Those
those are sort of the part of the glue that holds the, the overall antenna system together. And those, that diver provides the, the absorption now that 850 or 870 nanometers that is there in the native antenna complex. So is there any reason why they are vertically oriented and not far away? Well, I mean, these molecules, if you look at these molecules, they look like this, right? So it, it's, a, it's a rather symmetric structure. So like this versus like this, it's just a but if you they're, they're changing the optical carry where the uh, optical axes are, but they're uh, they're they're located in the structure like this. So these 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 uh, hydrophobic tails, all of the orientations of these molecules and how they connect to the structure are part of the folding that makes the assembly stable and tight like they are. So one of the parts of this work is we try not to um, affect too much the structure of the native antenna, use that scaffolding like it is, it's a proven robust structure, and then do our attachment someplace that's not going to change that. Any other questions? Well, okay, well, I thank you for coming and thank you for your attention. I guess Natalie and Aaron are out there making sure the piece is not like being taken away by the engineering graduate students. And so since some of you were engineers, you can come and have some pizza and we can talk.